Mozart Concerto in C major is what we're talking about today. And we will get there, but we're going to be dealing with a new area of research and a new area of, of music theory analysis. And so I think it needs a little bit of background. And so we're going to go on a little bit of a winding road for a few minutes. We'll be looking briefly at the first few measures of a CPE Bach keyboard sonata. We're going to talk about some uh, theatrical characters that exist that, that were created back centuries ago, just very briefly. All of this will make sense as soon as we start talking about the Mozart. So, um, it's the Mozart Concerto is probably the single work that is, is most commonly encountered by serious oboists and professional oboists, right? We can't we can't escape it. It's inescapable. And um, it's this very familiarity which fuels controversy over this piece. Um, we study and practice it in school. We encounter it in auditions. We perform it sometimes. And everyone has their own ideas about things like phrasing and articulation and um, tempos and all of these different interpretive aspects and sometimes these are based on tradition what we get from our teacher and sometimes they're things that we discover for ourselves but when we change teachers and move on to another teacher what do we have to do we have to absorb their new ideas their new ideas on tempo their new ideas on articulation their new ideas on all these other things so avoiding these kinds of controversies is one of my goals today. Okay, I'm not going to talk about articulation. I'm not going to talk about phrasing. I'm not going to talk about anything like that. Um, we are instead going to be looking at this fairly recent development of scholarship and research and looking at foundational pre-existing or stock components, okay, that, that are in use and that are be more and more being discovered every day. This is, like I said, this is a new area. Mozart and other composers use these as starting points for their compositions. And um, sometimes when we think about this time period, Mozart, Haydn, CPE Bach, the other Bach composers, um, sometimes we think about them sitting down at their writing table or their desk and then just out of nowhere, just out of the, the, the thin air, comes these brilliant ideas and they put it down on paper. And, and we think that they just got them out of, out of, you know, that they just came from nowhere. But that's, we've, we're learning that that really wasn't the case. They were drawing on material that already existed and that they had inherited from generations of composers that had come before them and generations of teachers that had come before them. So we shouldn't be surprised that we find these pre-existing elements in this music. Um, in early music, music of centuries and centuries ago, the medieval period, the Renaissance, we already find pre-existing melodies and other sequences of notes found in various parts. Sometimes those are in the soprano, sometimes even more frequently we find those pre-existing things in the bass line. Sometimes entire masses were, have been written on just one pre-existing chant or one pre-existing melody. And so we, we see that in the distant past. Um, we also can find this in the Baroque as well. We may have to look a little bit more carefully because of the complexity of the Baroque and all the counterpoint that goes on. But if we look, we can still find these pre-existing pre um, components. In modern times, we see jazz musicians who use pre-existing melodies to create new and often very different music from the originals. At times, they're signifying. At times, their, their approach um, may be more, uh, you know, it, it, may be, it may be more tropological. And while there may be only brief fragments of notes in what they use, 
Sometimes large components of pre-existing works are used to create something that is enti an entirely different approach, but it's all very recognizable. So we see this in modern times in, in jazz. Um, we also see this stock material sometimes in other areas in the arts. One of the most obvious places that we could go for that would be um, in the in the Comedia, the Comedia dell'arte from centuries ago, the theatrical tradition of the Comedia dell'arte that, that that continues on into the modern time. There we find stock recognizable characters who have assigned personality traits that appear again and again in original pieces of, of theatrical work. So just for an example of some of these characters, we have Colombina and Harlequin as examples, of, uh, as some of these theatrical examples. We know if we may be seeing a new play, but if we see Harlequin on the stage, well, and you know that that's supposed to be Harlequin, well, we know that that character is going to act in a particular way. It's maybe a new play, we don't know what's going to happen, but they're going to act in a particular way. Columbina, same way. If we know that that's Columbina, she's going to act in a particular way. Pantalone, same thing. These are all stock characters. There are many of them, but since most of us in the room are probably oboists, we have to mention one more, and that's going to be Pulcinella. Right, and so these characters from centuries ago, they have specific personalities that get imported into original works. So there is that stock element. Again, now, don't check your schedule. We really are going to get to the Mozart Concerto, all right? Even though we're talking about jazz and we're talking about, we're talking about um, these other things. Like I said, it's gonna be a little bit of a winding road for a few minutes, but yes, we are going to get there. So, noted scholar Robert Yerdigan has opened up a whole new universe of historical and music theory analysis in his book, Music in the Gallant Style, 2007, so not that long ago. And this is being picked up by lots of different people and used, and, and, and um, it is just kind of exploding in a new area of, of artistic, re of, um, uh, scholarly research. In this, he demonstrates that composers from the Gallant period, roughly about 17, the 1720s to the 1770s, used stock musical phrases employed in conventional sequences. Okay, so here is this stock idea, this pre-existing material being imported into an original work. And they use them for the foundational basis for their compositions. So he uses the term galant schemata in identifying these stock phrases. So when Yer in, in Yerdigan's book, he ends his analysis with roughly the 1770s. But if we look forward, we still continue to see this. If we use Beethoven as an example, early Beethoven features some of these stock elements contained in there. Middle Beethoven, or sometimes heroic, the heroic era of Beethoven, we find them as well. Once he starts getting more harmonically adventurous in late Beethoven, these kind of disappear. But we see it all the way up through the middle period of Beethoven. So let's look at the mechanics of how these stock phrases and sequences work. Elliot Hauser had an excellent article on this called Introduction to Gallant Schemata. And he notes that a, a schema, a single schemata, a, sing, a schema is a prototype, an idealized version of a common pattern. All right? And so, one, we have a prototype, the idealized thing that we're looking for. But he also notes that a schema can be an exemplar a single pattern that resembles the prototype. So, this is the key, a pattern that resembles the prototype. Only, only using the prototypes in an unaltered form, that's gonna result in, in just monotonous, derivative music. And so, it's rare to see a composer that of any ability 
using a bare unmodified schema. It's Hauser's exemplars that interest us. The pattern that resembles the prototype. So the prototype immersed in original notes, surrounding them, filling them out, and um, creating beauty and emotional content to this prototype. So let's look at how this all gets applied. Here are a couple examples of Yerdigan's schemata sequences. One, this first one that we're gonna look at is called a printer. Now, he named them after some of his colleagues that helped him in this research. There are a couple of these things that existed with earlier music theorist, theoreticians that have passed on or no longer with us. History didn't notice the work that they did with these until Yerdigan came along and kind of started pointing these out and finding others. So he named a couple after earlier theorists. Um, some of them, if you just look at the actual combination of the notes, the names make sense. And then there are a few that are just whimsical, that he's just, he's just given whimsical names to. But there's a printer. Uh, it does not have to be an F. It does not have to be an A. You can transpose this into any key and still have a printer. But this is the relationship, the intervallic relationship, and the direction of the notes. And then a Romanesco. We have two different versions. One is called a leaping Romanesco, where the bass line jumps down couple of fourths there with a, with a scalar um, upper line. And then there is a fully stepwise Romanesca at the bottom. There's actually a third one, a Gallant Romanesca, but we don't need that for the analysis of the Mozart Concerto, and so I didn't add that in here. So we have these two. What I want to show you is the application of how this is being used in a scholarly way. So as I said, we're going to look at a keyboard sonata before we get to the Mozart. Uh, H248, the first movement, the first eight measures. This is Rabinovich's analysis using, using, these, um, using these schemata. Now these are not, these numbers here, these are not um, part of figured base analysis or anything like that, they're scale degrees. And so what he's doing is pointing out, as you saw in the, in the examples, what he's doing is pointing out where these scale degrees exist. So we have a stepwise Romanesca here at the beginning, followed by the start of a printer where we match up these notes here and here. Then there's, mu there's original music inserted and the printer doesn't end until we get here at the end, which, which is then followed, sorry, which is then followed by a half cadence um, in, the, in the first eight measures. So this is, this is how this is being analyzed. You have to find where the, where the actual notes are within the broader scope of the piece of music. All right. Um, so another example of a, of a schema is the quiescenza, is the quiescenza. And this is what it looks like. This is one of the easier ones to hear within music because we move down from a, a flatted seventh to the sixth up to a raised seventh back to the octave. A lot of times this is preceded by, by octave notes here. So this lowered seventh would actually be moving down from the C above it. So um, let's listen to some examples of this. Again, because the top line motion is easy to hear. I believe we'll have sound here in a second, but the, we're going to start about 30 seconds into this video, and there's a choir that's going to be singing Gloria in Chelsea's Deo, followed by Et in Terra Pax Omnibus. The schema is not on the glory in Excelsis Deo. It is when they sing at Intero Pax um, Omnibus. That is where we're going to hear. That's where we're going to hear it. Uh, this is some Mozart, but we're not going to start with the Mozart. We'll start here. There it is. Repeated. That was the schema. 
Next example, a little harder to hear, but it's there. I'll listen to about four more examples and then we'll move on. This one's a little harder to hear. A lot going on here, but, th but it's there. Was 74. This is the last era that he really used them. And the last example. This was very obvious. So, a few examples. Now, finally, what we're here for, the Mozart Concerto, the introduction and the exposition. What happens when we start looking for these gallant schemata of Jernigan in this, this piece of music that we can't escape, okay? Beginning the introduction, as we all know, features an emphasis on the key of C major and also utilizes simple simple cadences. Mozart spends, spends time establishing, yes, this is in C major. So we don't get a lot of, of motion, especially motion that could be could be implied as chromatic. But the first appearance of a Gallant schema is in measures 22 or 23 through 25. Still in the, in the introduction, the oboe hasn't started, the solo oboe hasn't come in yet. This one is a monte. So we have, we have a, um, in this example, half step down and then moving up and then another half step down. Notice that the bass ascends chromatically. Well, where do we get that? Here, and my writing is not particularly dark at this slide, I apologize, but notice the ascending bass line here, and we have notes here, here, um, assigned to the appropriate bass line, and then notes over here that match up. The only thing that is missing is what? The chromatic motion here. We don't have an F sharp, but think about it. If there was an F sharp, if he had included the F sharp, we, there would be an implication, oh, we might be moving to G, we might be modulating. That early in the movement, he's not gonna want that, especially from a common practice composer. So he omits the F sharp, but this is still very much a monte, okay? Then we move on to the entrance of the um, solo part with a sol fa mi uh, schema. And so this example here, 
for it, we are in the key of C, the so fall, the so fall, me obviously comes from the soprano line, from the top line. And then also we're going to get in the same, nearly in the same entrance with the orchestra, we're gonna get a Meyer, which looks like that. These are the prototypes. These are the idealized versions that we are looking for. We have to find those within the other notes. So, um, Sorry, um, we'll get to those. The, there is, um, I, I am missing, I am missing one, one section of the score. I apologize. The so fall, the so fall me uh, comes in the very first entrance of the of the oboe part, where we have that ascending scalar C major passage up to that long held, that long held um, C that extends out over the orchestral accompaniment. Many times we think, what what is this doing here? Why is this why is this um, why is this important? And we think, oh well, I need to play a crescendo here, or I need to day crescendo, and then I need to and then I need to crescendo. In reality, that whole section is a gallant schema, and it identifies which one it is by the emphasis of that C over the top of it, extending out like a pedal only above over 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 that whole gallant schemata and it identifies which one it is so it is actually very functional even though we're just sitting up there on that high C and and um, and it doesn't seem like it's doing that much it is critical to that particular schema now after that we have measure 36 measure 37 we start a Romanesca a stepwise variant we've already seen the example of that so I don't have that up here but um, here we have the descending stepwise lines down here that we need. We have the associated lines up here, taking this A and this A to be the same, uh, the, the same um, pitch in the sequence, and ending here. So we have a Romanesca stepwise. Then the Aprila um, looks like this, and. It appears here. So we spend lots of time working on that, right? And we try to figure out how to phrase it. Well, this is actually, there are notes within each one of this. This is not just something that seems like an etude that you would assign a student. This actually is functional. It is doing things within two examples of this schema here that, that sets itself up and then repeats itself. So this is, this is um, an, yet another example of, of one of Yerdigan's schema. Now, I'm not giving you an example of this because this would actually be one of the schema in inversions. And so far, Yerdigan and the other experts in this field have not acknowledged that when you get an inversion of one of these schemas, that it's a legitimate schema. So I'm not telling you this is a legitimate one, but but this would be the schema called a ponte, this would be inverted, and this one would be inverted. And then we wind up heading into C major there, when I can't see the C major. Now we have a do re mi. This is one of the more common schemas that we that we encounter, and he named it obvious for obvious reasons, he named it do re mi. Here, in the solo line, it appears. These are the connected notes that go with it. Um, as we progress through here, there is, there's just a general analysis of key and certain places that is down there. It's not terribly important for us to, uh, to follow that, but it, it helps with knowing exactly what's going on with the with the different schema. So here, we're in C major. Um, Schenker would have loved this because it looks like we're planing here, and we get another one, another do, re, mi, if we have, if we were moving on to, harmonically to a different area, but we have a pedal happening there, so it's, that's not, that's not what's going on. Now we have a modulating printer that happens here, and um, there is no third in here to avoid to avoid um, other problems with the harmonic motion. So 
Again, there is one component that's missing, like in the very first one, but he did. It's, it's clear that he did that for harmonic reasons to not confuse his listener as to where things were going. So we have a modulating printer here, we have a modulating printer here. We move into a section that is fairly convincingly in G major, but there's no perfect, no perfect authentic cadence happening there. So we really haven't gone full-fledged into G major yet. We get another printer with a modulating variant, and, but it's in diminution here. And so this is, this is um, clear that that's what's happening, but it happens so quickly that it may have just been a convenient tool that he used in this particular segment of the, of the composition. We throw in a lot of Roman numeral analysis down here. It's not really that necessary, except to point out that we're, we're not firmly grounded in a particular tonal area at this moment in, in, the, in the exposition. This is another thing with Yerdigan's work that, had, that he's demonstrating that this idea of, or how we teach Roman numeral analysis as a fundamental component in, in higher levels of music education they didn't, they didn't really do that back then. Um, it's more of a 20th century um, phenomenon, and there are experts in this who are taking Yerdigan's work with these schema and starting to create a music curriculum with, with them, because hundreds of years ago, they weren't using Roman numeral analysis like we do today. Yes, they had figured bass and realization of figured bass, but they didn't use it like we did today. They talk music very differently from the way we do it. Then, and we have a, another example of do, re, mi here. Do, re, mi if we were in G, but we're not. And um, then we have an embedded ponte over here. You have to really pick and choose notes as to which ones belong to create that. Was he really thinking of Ponte there? Or was he just using it kind of as inspiration and as a, as a technique and using what he needed? That's probably more likely. It could have been inspiration. He probably wasn't thinking, oh, this is, this, is, this is the sequence I'm using here. But it does appear as a Ponte and ends here. It's just that within the active 16s, you have to pick and choose what notes you need to make it happen. Uh, we have a false do, re, mi here. We have the do, we have the re, but we have an E flat. So that is a, that is a clear indication that, that um, you know, it doesn't make an authentic, an authentic do, re, mi scheme. But this is so typical of Mozart, right? How often do we get false recapitulations in Mozart? He loves to try and fool his audience. Um, the, the Mozart Oboe Quartet, first movement, there is a section that is a beautiful compositional sentence that is a perfect example, except he splits it, he splits the sentence and inserts an extra measure of something else. So that if you took that out and put the pieces together, you could have a perfect, theory textbook example of a sentence, only it's not because he because he, he he inserts something extra, he changes something to make it false. Same thing here. You love to do things like this. It was it's a false, it's a false do re mi setup. Then we have a sol fa mi and a modulating printer. This one is pretty clear. All of the notes line up the way they should and we, we create a pretty clear um, example of, of a soul fall me. Now, it is not the prototype. It is not pure like the prototype is, but it's pretty clear of what's happening here. And then we get a modulating printer, which works differently, but this one also is pretty cut and dry. Lots of the notes are repeated, well, lots of the required notes are repeated and stacked in octaves at the appropriate times. So it's pretty clear that he was thinking modulating printer here, and it finishes here with a half cadence. So what did it do? It did exactly its job. It was a modulating printer. It allowed us to cadence in the key of the dominant. Now, we get an extended, we're in G, 
where we get an extended pedal here, and he spends some time establishing where we're at harmonically. There's a whole lot of variation that happens with the schemas. So from this point on to the end of the exposition, he's very concerned in setting up the key that we all expect, right? To move to set up the key of the dominant as to where we're supposed to wind up because it's common practice and at the at the end of the exposition you're setting up you're setting up the development section. So we're expecting to do that. There are multiple examples you're about to see that that say nearly a printer or nearly something else or almost something else. I think he was using it as inspiration, but because a lot of these can be used for shifting your harmonic motion within the composition, I think he was avoiding certain notes that would do that. So I think the schema are being used for inspiration in what he's writing, but he's being careful to not let them lead your ear in a direction that it's not supposed to go. So we nearly have a printer here. We would need an F sharp there and an E there, he doesn't give it to you. So that rules out a printer. This here, here within the this bracket and this bracket is almost a Romanesca. It's interrupted by what's within the dotted brackets, like he likes to do sometimes, take something standard and then insert something in the middle to make it different or to make it something unexpected. So this is almost a Romanesca. It could also be interpreted as an interrupted printer. But it's not either one of those because of what is missing. This, starting with this bracket, is almost a modulating printer. But he doesn't want to modulate, right? We are headed for a big cadence to set up G major. So he doesn't want, he doesn't want to disrupt the harmonic flow, the harmonic motion. This is almost a ponte. This is also almost a ponte. But if he had given us all the notes in a ponte, that would have started to take us someplace else and he doesn't want to do that. Again, he wants to get us to G major. Then we have pretty clear direction here in the accompaniment. We all know what happens in the solo line. The exposition ends here with a perfect, with a perfect authentic cadence landing on G major there. Very clear, that's where we finally arrived. So, yes, we've all studied this. Yes, we've all looked at it. But there are all of these component parts that up until a few years ago, most people really didn't know that they were there. This is what he was drawing on. This is what he started with, and then he added things around it. Now, should the primary notes of the ponte be the ones we emphasize? I'm not going to say that that's the case. Because, first of all, Mozart was a musician. He's going to create music. He creates beautiful music. And that's going to resonate with us. If those particular notes of the Ponte or of the Romanesco or of the printer or whatever schema you're identifying, if it doesn't seem to make musical sense to emphasize those particular notes and bring them out, I don't think it, I don't think that we should, because again, first and foremost, Mozart was a musician, and it's supposed to sound like music. And so, but, but this does give us another tool of seeing what he was starting with, where he was coming from. What, did, what tool did he pull in in this measure? What tool did he pull in in this measure? And how did he elaborate on it? How did he make it beautiful? How did he make it music? Okay. So, now that you've seen all of this, we've got a full score of the exposition with a recording. And I chose a particular recording for this. The main reason I did it was of all the ones that I listened to, the orchestral parts can be heard the best in this recording, in my opinion. Now, I haven't tried it on this equipment. Could make it sound a little bit different, but. When I, was, when I was testing different ones, you can hear the different orchestral parts well in this recording, including the bass line, which with these schema, 
are frequently very important to be able to hear the bass line. So, um, give me one second to escape out of this and start the recording. This is a recording of um, Isotov when he was principal in Chicago. Yeah, the, the performance comes from two, 2007, ironically the same, or coincidentally the same year as Yerdigan's book was published. This is a live performance, and there's more information about it in my footnotes at the end, if you're curious. Everything in here is footnoted. We may be slightly loud here. Um, volumes here. I'm going to drop this down a little bit. As soon as I'm sure this is going well, I'll go back to the score and follow the score. You could have read it for yourself, I didn't have to tell you all. section. Is there anything that we want to discuss? Any questions that you'd like to ask? Anything that you 
observed here that maybe I didn't quite address. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to ask, do you think that this was just such a common, these scars were just such a common sound at the time that he was drawn to it without sort of thinking it through at, 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 at that level? He was using that, but it was just so in common to their ears that that was why it was there. Right. You know, I, I'm kind of, your, your, your question kind of draws me to something my sophomore theory teacher said. Uh, when she said, you know, these people were not sitting around with a diagram of sonata form on their wall. And they didn't sit there and say, oh, now it's time for theme two of the, you know, they didn't do that. And it was just the common practice. We call it the, we call it the common practice era. He wasn't thinking of the, he, I'm sure he didn't think of these things with special names. They were, they were things that, that were, um, that were taught, that were passed on. These fragments, people knew them, at least these intervallic fragments that, that existed, they knew them. We've actually found recently, within the last, again, few years, Juergen talks about um, actual notebooks that people have created that have some of these things in them that taught students how to improvise. And they were used, they were used for teaching how to improvise and for composition as well. So yeah, this was just ingrained. I'm, I'm convinced it was ingrained. They didn't, like my professor said, they, don't, they didn't have them up on their walls.